Hey, Jeannie. Hey, Prue. Who's our guest on the show today? We have Chris Tolls from Yardstick. Hey, Chris. Howdy. How are you doing? Hey, Good. welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Yeah, what are we going to learn about today? Uh, we're going to learn about soil carbon sequestration and particularly how hard it is to measure. We are in early days of solving the problem, but we have discovered exactly how hard it is. I can tell you that much for sure. Very cool. So what do you do? Uh, I'm the CEO of Yardstick. Uh, we are a soil carbon measurement company. So you've probably heard of soil carbon efforts in the news, particularly in the context of agriculture. A lot of times conversations around soil carbon come alongside so-called regenerative agriculture, basically acknowledging, hey, you know, the, the way that we're farming and ranching today has a massive greenhouse gas footprint. Some of that is unavoidable, but a lot of that potentially could be mitigated and, and even reversed. Well, it's awesome. And I know Project Drawdown lists regenerative agriculture and lots of other kind of agricultural pieces as big chances to reduce carbon. But I think this is one of the arguments Bruce and I have often, and Bruce says, how are you going to count it and, and that type of thing? So yeah, well, that's exactly the piece of the puzzle uh, we're trying to solve because as Drawdown and others have acknowledged, the theoretical potential of soils to sequester atmospheric CO2 is like massive. And I can show you a little data around that in a moment. Um, but the practical challenge is that, you know, if you can't measure it, like you can't manage it. So what we're trying to do is bridge the gap between a lot of literature that is very like directionally positive, but also acknowledge that today, the specific causal relationship between, you know, farming practice X and tons Y is, is murky. And so our suspicion is that of the you know 173 things that are lumped into this unhelpfully broad category of regenerative agriculture, like everything in the world, there's an 80-20 rule here, and probably only 10 of those practices actually move the needle. But if we don't have really high quality, affordable measurement technologies, you know, uh, how can we even tell the difference? So that's the whole reason that uh, I started the company. Awesome. What I've heard about is no-till, and I finally learned what that even means because it didn't make sense, but I saw the movie Kiss the Ground, which was pretty cool, but a lot of hyperbole maybe because it sounds too good to be true. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm a marketer, so I have a great empathy and respect for my fellow marketers uh, in the world, but you're right that a lot of the way these practices get talked about publicly is getting out over our skis. So for example, even like the concept of, of no-till, there's not a binary set of behaviors out there, this called tillage and this called no-till. When you've got 900 million acres under management in America and millions of people in charge of managing those acres, unsurprisingly, what would be tempting to simplify as a like, today you till, you should stop tilling is actually an infinite variety of flavors of tillage. Um, even like literally the different kinds of machines that you would hook up behind a tractor to do the tillage dramatically change the climate impact of that tillage. So while yardstick is definitely part of the conversation of saying, hey, we should look critical at these practices, a lot of the oversimplification that happens to say, just cover crop, just no-till, often those arguments are being made by people who don't farm for a living. And so uh, I think deservedly, they, they tend to get laughed at. And also uh, there's sort of a losing the nuance piece of the conversation that's challenging for folks who are then trying to apply these practices because they, they go back to their farms and they're saying like, what is this mystical no-till you speak of? Like, how the hell am I supposed to get rid of weeds uh, if I don't till? How the hell am I supposed to address compaction if I don't till? And unsurprisingly, you know, Hollywood doesn't like to dig into the details there, but that's really where the hard work is. Uh, and so Yardstick was created to be the measurement layer of that decision-making so that we can acknowledge it's not binary. All tillage is not bad, right? It exists for a reason. All of our behaviors of today exist for a good reason. And instead, how can we be a little more specific around of the you know 93 different kinds of tillage that actually exist, which do have what climate impacts? Because that's a very complicated question to answer. Again, when you start talking about 900 million acres, and that's just the US, you know, you can even imagine how much broader it gets overseas. Yardstick basically uh, started in two places. The first is my co-founders and I looking at climate change sort of from first principles and saying like, hey, as you point out, you know, draw down on others. Like, what do people who literally think about this for a living say could have removal potential? So I'll show you this graph. This is one analysis that is lodged very deeply in my brain. And this is basically mapping different carbon removal approaches and their potential. And when I say carbon removal, to be clear, I mean ways of removing existing atmospheric greenhouse gases. 
mitigation and reducing real emissions inarguably should have 80, 90% of our attention today, classic like ounce of prevention, pound of cure. Um, but when you do the math, unfortunately, we have reached the point where mitigation alone, even if we have extreme acceleration of reduction in emissions will be insufficient. The flywheel is already spinning. There's already gonna be too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for us to avoid catastrophic two or two and a half sea levels. Therefore, removal is going to have to happen. You know, uh, it, it literally must be part of the the equation. So, unsurprisingly, a lot of folks are looking at that and saying, "Okay, granted, you know, overwhelming majority of our focus should continue to be on mitigation. What could be there in the removals bucket down the road?" And this is a helpful graph for starting to like have that conversation. So, on the x-axis, you have gigaton removal potential per year, of the you know seven or eight different strategies that are noted here, like just from you know an excel spreadsheet perspective what could it do because obviously the ones that have the potential to do more you know should deserve more of our attention and then on the y axis is cost you know a, a removal technology that can do 10 gigatons a year but do so at $1000 a ton is you know uh, a challenge compared to something that might even be able to do half that but do it at a much lower price and what we want of course is the bottom right we want large removal potential in gigatons per year or fractions thereof and then we want it to be cheap. We want to be able to deploy it by uh, spending as, as little money as possible. And conspicuously, because I run a company focused on enabling soil carbon, you see soil carbon is right there in the bottom right. You know, call it three to six gigatons a year potential, and then doing that all below $100 a ton. And to be clear, even this graph is like very aspirational in terms of the cost of some of these technologies. Like there is no DAC today at, at $300 a ton. There could be, but today we're not there. Per ton of CO2 or per ton of carbon? CO2E, CO2 equivalent. Yeah, because you know uh, different types of emissions have different warming factors, like refrigerants famously are very, very, could be 1,500, you know, 3,000 times the warming potential of CO2. Uh, this graph is in CO2E. So we basically saw this graph. This is kind of, you know, part one of the artistic story and said like, bottom right, like, sounds good. <laughs> I wonder what's going on there. Uh, and I wonder what's holding us back. And, you know, just to be sure, like, we should probably take a look at what other people are saying. This data is from IPCC, you know, the UN's climate change effort. So high quality data, but nonetheless, you know, do other folks feel the same? So here's a, a second graph that's also been really influential for us. These bars are all estimates of the carbon removal potential of soils, agriculture. X-axis is the year in which that estimate was made. The estimate being a soil scientist or researcher saying, okay, this many tons, these kinds of practices, you know, again, the, the Excel spreadsheet fancy Excel spreadsheet, but Excel spreadsheet approach. And then Y axis is gigatons per year of removal. Same X axis as the previous graph. So you can see here, you know, every few years, every two, three years, a new researcher takes a look at the, the question. And there's a wide range because we're early days, there's a ton of uncertainty, but like they all end up in this, you know, gigaton a year range for sure. And you know, somewhat arbitrarily, that's a worth our time sort of threshold that a lot of folks in the carbon removal community use. A gigaton a year would be massive. And also like we probably need a few tens of gigatons of year of removal by, you know, 2050 to, to really be um, moving the needle. So these graphs show us, you know, it's, it's not just the, uh, the previous chart I showed you, but soil scientists around the world agree in the potential. And that word potential is, is really important because we are not doing much of the potential today because we have not prioritized the climate impact of, of agriculture as sort of a performance criteria um, in the past. So part one of the story, my co-founders and I look at these two graphs and we're like, all right, soil carbon could like really move the needle. What's holding it back? And that gets us to part two. And part two, the scientific foundation of Yardstick is really the work of a woman named Christine Morgan. She is the chief scientific officer of the Soil Health Institute, which is a, a private soil research nonprofit. She was previously tenured soil science professor at Texas A&M for about a decade. And while she was there, she realized what many other people are realizing now in that, hey, soil carbon is really hard to measure. And so if we have a really hard time measuring something, how well are we really going to be able to take, you know, those bars from these estimates and start to shrink the range of uncertainty, as well as how well are we really going to help a farmer or a rancher have confidence that the decisions that they're making are, are really moving the needle. So some time ago, uh, while a professor, she said, hey, we should look into alternative technologies. The way you measure soil carbon today is physically taking a, a piece of soil, a, a cylinder usually of soil, out of the farm. You do that by slamming a stainless steel cylinder into the ground over and over and over uh, pretty brutally. 
and then you mail that soil hundreds or thousands of miles away to a lab um, to oversimplify slightly, the lab basically incinerates it and then tells you the carbon content of soils. That is not a 21st century process. It is incredibly laborious. It's also error prone. You know, you can lose samples. And because especially of the lab equipment that's used, it's very expensive. So when you have an expensive measurement technology, you don't use it all that much. And Christine's insight was, hey, what other technologies are out there that could help us address this cost problem? And she landed on spectroscopy. That's a, a fancy science word for basically a movie. Um, you know, if I showed you a movie of me walking around a zoo and I said, point to the, you know, giraffe, you saw the giraffe and you would point to the giraffe. You'd be like, that's a giraffe. And that's because you know what the shape of a giraffe is. Same exact premise, but we're talking about the shape of carbon in soils. So her insight was if we could take a spectrometer, which invariably has a, a lens, you know, imagine a, a small camera and put a spectrometer into the soil to take a movie of the soil and then teach the spectrometer, hey, what's the shape of carbon? We would be able to generate the same data that labs generate, but do so without removing soils from the ground, without the labs, and therefore dramatically reducing the cost. And that's what she has committed a big chunk of her a very illustrious career to. We connected last year, 2020, that is. My hardware co-founder, amazing guy named Kevin, he was like, this is amazing literature. This is totally real and could really work. Like we should turn this into a product. So we collaborated on a grant together. And last fall, in fall 2020, we got a $3.6 million grant from the Department of Energy's ARPA-E program, uh, sort of federal government's R&D fund to advance the technology. And so here's a little video you can see of me using one of our prototypes this past spring takes about 30 seconds. It's non-destructive. You don't have to remove soils from the field. And our goal is really to be the data backbone of soil carbon around the world. Again, to go back to those bars of estimates, you know, how do we move from soils could do gigaton per year removal potential to soils are doing that? If we're going to go from there to here, uh, we need a measurement technology that is so cheap and so deployable that it can be used in every instance where we hope Again, coming back to these regenerative practices that practice X, you know, no-till, whatever it is, is actually moving the needle on real changes in soil carbon stocks. So we started the company after we got that grant. And uh, here we are about nine months later.